This morning, the World Health Organization officially declared COVID-19 a pandemic. It has been declared a pandemic because of the alarming levels of spread and severity, as well as, to quote the World Health Organization, the alarming levels of inaction by governments around the world. So what does declaring COVID-19 a pandemic mean? A pandemic doesn't refer to the severity or the deadliness of the disease. Rather, the pandemic label is more about how widespread the disease is how, and subsequently how easily it can be spread. The designation is intended to emphasise to the public the importance of needing to treat this matter seriously from a preventative perspective. The, declar de the declaration of a pandemic means that the World Health Organisation's recommendations shift from containment schemes to recommending that countries implement mitigation measures. Mitigation means shifting towards things like shutting down schools and businesses where that's appropriate, postponing large gatherings, imposing, imposing social distancing measures and quarantining. The unfortunate outcome though of mitigation is of course that it has significantly high economic impacts. At this stage, neither Australia nor Queensland have passed a pandemic policy action plan, but they're no doubt on the way. Western Australia released theirs last night and it outlines how government, households, businesses, etc. should prepare for and respond to the pandemic. There is no doubt that COVID-19 is shaping up to be the most significant challenge of 2020 and possibly even the decade. Uh, today we want to provide some guidance to businesses uh, as to some of the issues that they may face and some solutions as to how to minimise the impacts of COVID-19. Today's session is a Q&A panel session which is chaired by me. My name is Emma Kovacevic and I'm a partner in the corporate group. Uh, to my right is Heidi Cray, uh, who will be talking about some of the employment issues. Uh, Chris Erfurt, who will be talking about some insurance and business interruption issues. Shay McCartney, who will be talking about safety issues. And Eleanor Dickens, who will talk about the importance of privacy. So first and foremost, we must protect the health and safety of others. But a lot of, a lot of the measures that we are seeing seeing seem to be on the verge of hysteria. It's hard to see how some of those measures are necessary to protect large number of people for whom the disease does not pose a significant, a ri significant risk. Shay, are you able to comment on that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion which is creating to a whole lot of misconception about what these measures are actually intended to be. And we actually have to sort of step back a bit and think about it as almost three different risk measures. The first one is about an individual's risk and obviously everyone has an obligation under the legislation um, and just um, generally to take care of their own health and safety. So first and foremost you have to look after your own um, health and safety and then not put other people at risk. Secondly, an organisation has to um, ensure the health and safety of its workers so it has to take steps that are reasonably practicable to ensure the health and safety of um, <coughs> its workers and other people it might put at risk. And those measures are based on what we know about a risk, um, what we ought reasonably know about a risk, the likelihood um, of uh, something occurring and the consequences if it occurs. So that's a moving feast at the moment and there is a lot of misinformation about what that looks like but then there's also a lot of information that says that you know the significant consequences but it also changes per individual. So people who are um, immune suppressed, people who have respiratory illness, people who are um, older, are all actually at very high critical risk. And almost every organisation will have those people in their workplaces or will come into contact with those people. So we do have to look at a high consequence risk um, and also at the moment, what is looking like more and more like a, a high um, likelihood. The next lot of measures though are the ones that I think people are getting um, quite concerned about because they seem quite draconian and they seem disproportionate to the level of risk to the 80% of people who for, for this it'll be nothing more than a flu. And these are the community protection measures and this is what you know calling a pandemic is about. And that's not about necessarily saying that the majority of people are at serious risk of harm but it's about, as a community, how do we protect the people who are most vulnerable? And they call it flattening the curve because our health system can't cope with all of the cases that may come in at the same time. So that if it spreads as quickly as it's, um, as it's looking like, 
then all of those cases, that there's not enough respirators, there's not enough um, oxygen tanks, there's not enough um, capacity in our hospitals to deal with those people. So all these measures about closing events, shutting down um, offices, working from home, um, the, the personal um, distancing measures are all about slowing the spread so that everyone doesn't peak at the same time um, at the hospital system. And I think we saw in yesterday's newspaper there's quite a good graph which shows the, the spread yeah. uh, where they flatten the curve. Um, we know undoubtedly that um, COVID-19 is causing significant operational impacts on people's, people's businesses already. Um, so broadly, what precautions can I take to protect the health and safety of my employees and ultimately minimise the impact that COVID-19 has on my business? Jane. Um, so there's a lot of information about that and you know, we obviously don't have time to go through all of them now but we have put out some briefing papers that um, talk about some of um, those measures. The World Health Organisation is continually updating those measures but I think what the most critical thing is that businesses actually need to sit down and do their own risk assessment for their business and they actually need to, um, you know, people are calling it scenario mapping, um, however you want to describe it but you actually have to look at where does your organisation has the touch points because an organisation for example who's dealing with um, you know people who have disabled um, people in their business um, they may have a lot of difficulties in dealing with some of these things people who don't have an ability to work from home other organisations may be able to send everyone home and work from home um, with with quite a lot of these so um, you've got to actually um, implement your normal risk measurement, uh, risk assessment measures and sit down and look at the hazard, look at what controls are available to you and then keep reassessing them. That's the, the most important thing. Thank you. So Heidi, um, hypothetically, if my employee calls me uh, tomorrow morning uh, before she comes to the office and says that overnight she's developed symptoms or that she, and she's being tested, or, or that she has been tested and is shown to be positive, uh, what, what is my next step? What do I do next? Uh, hypothetically, that's, that question has been posed to, to me and many of my colleagues frequently in recent weeks, largely because of what we were just talking about, the, the scare, the impact, and potentially uh, the hysteria that is approached to what do I do? It amazes me that we are not asking the employee sufficient information at that juncture when they do contact us. But hopefully at the point, the fact that they have contacted us is because we had already put in place an action plan. That action plan being that we would require our employees to disclose and inform us of information, which may put at risk their safety and the safety, as Shay said, of their co-workers and our community. So if an employee has called, either that they are thinking they have symptoms or have tested positive, the first thing that we need to do is get as much information as possible about where the employee was, how they feel they may have contracted COVID-19, what interaction they have had outside of work and what interaction they have had at work, so that we're in a position to appropriately implement our plan. That is going to require then, once you've had full and complete disclosure, and you may require further medical disclosure, depending upon the hypothetical scenario as to when the person has been tested as positive, so that we can understand timelines, interactions, and what steps might need to be taken. You may very well need to shut your work premises. And understanding, as Jay said, the risk assessment about what that might mean for a particular business will also then require you to understand your industrial instruments. You might need to send people home. You might need to close because the circumstances of that employee's interaction with their co-workers may give rise to a risk of further exposure that you are going to have to address. Understanding those questions and what to ask up front will give you the opportunity to then make decisions about who else might need to be tested, who came into potential close contact with the employee. In circumstances where there are contractors or other business stakeholders and engagement clients and customers that may come into your business, there are other consequences in accordance with your action plan that you should reasonably be implementing. Emergency response communication, text message, email, and other communications are a good thing to be keeping in mind as part of your development of your action plan. Realising that working from home and other available options, as Shay said, should also be considered upfront 
because your ability to be agile, respond and be able to, to the extent possible, have business as usual is an important time as we meet those competing impacts of looking after our employees and our community and also our business. Thank you, that's good advice. Um, so Eleanor, my employee's information is, is private to her and she may not want me to share it around. What are the key privacy risks and issues in communicating with employees and, and also to external parties when I'm communicating about what might be going on with my employee? Well, the clear, the key risk really is making a disclosure that an individual has a COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, and that's obviously if you're managing a contagion situation and you're wanting to inform people that they have to go home because of X, Y, Z, the key risk in doing that is that you um, disclose the identity of that person um, who has that disease. Um, the, the, the reason why, I mean, that's obviously, that sort of information is personal information, so it's regulated by the Commonwealth Privacy Act, um, and in the state setting, at state governments, um, their, their um, state information privacy frameworks. Um, and in some senses, you could say that that sort of risk of breaching the act because you've disclosed that sort of information um, is almost exacerbated because it is health information. So personal information is obviously information that has the capacity to identify a person. Um, health information um, is sensitive information, sensitive personal information, and because of that it brings with it sort of a, a stepping up, if you like, of the regulatory framework uh, in how you should deal with that. So, and in if also with that, uh, if you're, say, for instance, working, you're a state government employee, you're working in a state hospital, the disclosure of that sort of information uh, also brings criminal offence provisions with it. So it's almost like we've got to manage taking care of the workplace and the employee's privacy, but also balancing that against our need as an employer to manage that risk appropriately across the workplace. Uh, so this week we've seen a significant number of corporate, corporate events that have been cancelled. Uh, we've seen companies implement policies around cancelling business travel. Uh, and various operations are being either postponed or cancelled. Um, Chris, what sorts of insurances are likely to be relevant? Um, well, firstly, as you've alluded to, um, the first cab off the ranks likely to be any travel insurance or event, bespoke event insurance held by the company. And I'm sure travel insurance may be of relevance to, to people personally as well. Um, in terms of the travel policies, the, the key issue is going to lie in the exclusions. Generally, there will be cover where trips are cancelled or interrupted. Um, however, there's a couple of exclusions that crop up in many of the policies which are problematic. Firstly, uh, known circumstances exclusions. Um, and some of the policies apply to circumstances known prior to booking the trip. Some apply to circumstances known prior to placing the policy and some, which seems a bit draconian, apply to circumstances that arose before you actually embarked upon the trip. Um, RACQ, um, who's a travel insurer, has released a uh, media release um, in the last couple of days regarding its circumstances exclusion. Um, and it says it will not cover cancellation for coronavirus for trips to any country for covers cover placed after 31 January um, and that's on the basis that at that point in time people ought to have known about the risk that that trip might not go ahead because of this. Um, so I think there's arguments that could be made both ways on that. Um, it could be said well that's a little unfair if um, I'd already booked the trip when I placed the cover but equally the insurer would say um, that they don't want to be exposed to the risk of people who, who did become aware of the risk and then this policy. Um, another common exclusion is where um, DFAT, so the Smart Traveller website, has issued a travel advisory saying do not travel. Um, and again, there'll be temporal considerations as, around that as to whether um, that exclusion applies at the time the trip was booked or at the time the policy was issued or even before the trip was embarked upon. Um, the corporate policies do tend to be a bit broader, more generously worded, particularly as regards the exclusions um, than the personal policies. Um, with event insurance, um, similar sort of considerations. Firstly, um, the trigger for the cover and whether it's going to apply 
uh, where the cancellation is a precautionary measure as, as opposed to something that's been uh, imposed upon you. Um, and secondly, whether there's any exclusions which might apply to a pandemic, epidemic, infectious disease, etc. Um, the, the third main category of insurance which might be relevant um, even now is business interruption insurance. Um, that's typically found in property insurance policies. Um, and this year already we've had fires, the floods and now the pestilence. And the key difference with this is... <laughs> Um, <laughs> the key difference with coronavirus is, is that there's no damage to the property um, and that's ordinarily the trigger for business interruption cover. Um, most of the standard wordings do contain extensions for infectious disease. Um, however, they're often limited to where there's a closure or evacuation of the premises that's been mandated by a local authority, so may not extend to um, precautionary steps which are being taken by some businesses. Um, bespoke wording is often broader than that and may provide cover, um, but that'll depend on a close analysis of the, the terms of the policy. Um, and further, some policies may also cover um, interruption, which is caused by um, the same types of issues that suppliers premises. Um, but again, that will depend on how broad the wording is. Um, and the last one, which I'll mention briefly is um, third party liability cover. If you're exposed by reason of the, these events to claims by third parties, for example, if you are a supplier, then that's a type of policy which ought to be reviewed. So the recommendation is for, for businesses to be reviewing their insurance policies at the moment to see if there is scope to claim? That's right. Um, the virus will affect different industries in different ways and uh, as always insurance will depend on what types of policies are held firstly and secondly what types uh, sorry, what those policies say, and then also the nature of the, the loss which is suffered. And uh, I read in the newspaper with interest today that uh, Trump has banned people who have travelled through Europe from entering the United States. Uh, what does that mean if, if Australians or people who have travelled to Australia are not permitted to travel to the United States? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, that will depend on the term of the, terms of the policy, um, but I have seen a couple of policies in recent days, um, one of which says um, that you're not covered if the government of any, of any country does not allow you to enter that country, mm -hmm. um, so that would apply. Um, and I've seen another policy which says you're not covered if there is government regulation, prohibition or restriction. So again, on its face, that would apply to, to Trump's ban, um, with the caveat that presently that's applying to Europe but if that were to be extended to Australia, then that would um, affect Australian policies which contain that wording in respect of trips to the US. Uh, one of the questions that we keep hearing um, from our clients this week is, what if my business doesn't have um, work from home capabilities? Uh, we saw that Clayton Newts had uh, a large number of uh, Sydney staff working from home last week. Um, we're able to do that as office workers, um, but there are a number of businesses that, that don't have that luxury. People like hairdressers, uh, people who work on site in mines, for example. Um, so, Shay, wh what are my options if I've, if I've got an employee um, who doesn't have the ability to work from home? Yeah, thanks, Emma. The first thing I think is for those people who um, can work from home is to um, take into account, and we had many cases um, about this, including the um, uh, hotel sex case, but um, which you know, find out more about that one um, if, if you're interested. Um, where it's been made quite clear that if you're directed to work from home, if you're working from home um, because of uh, the employer's uh, convenience, then while you're at work, that will become your workplace and all the obligations under the work health and safety legislation will apply. So when we're sending people to work from home, we have to actually think about their health and wellbeing and are they actually capable of working from home in a safe way? And um, for businesses like Clayton Utes, where working from home is quite a common thing, we already had quite a good set up, but for other um, companies that they might not know whether their technology um, is sufficient to, to allow them to work from home, whether they've got an ergonomic setup, um, whether there are other risks that are caused by, you know, taking big 
boxes of things home or, or planned home or whatever they might be doing. So first thing, um, they have to do a risk assessment about working from home. Um, secondly, it goes back to that point I made before, which is that we actually have to think about well, why are we sending people home? And is that because of the community directive? Have we actually had a health directive to um, not attend workplaces or not attend a certain area? or to close a certain area down, in which case we have to follow that health directive. And if we don't, um, it might be a breach of specific health um, regulations um, or also the, the breach of the health and safety legislation. But outside of a specific directive, it really then comes back to the risk assessment for the workplace. So we don't need to knee jerk and send everyone home just because, for example, a person has um, necessarily been um, diagnosed if they haven't into the workplace if there's no suggestion that they're exposing people. Um, alternatively, there might be no safe way for people to work. The risk may be considered to be too great and then, um, as Heidi said before, you might actually have to shut the workplace for a period. Um, I've got one client who is um, putting in place a directive, um, which is something that they're doing in Italy, where they're actually requiring workers to uh, do fortnightly shifts. So um, a group of workers are directed to have uh, a fortnight working from home, and then they swap over and the other, the other workers come in. So the idea being that they can identify um, during the period that they're off if, ever, if anyone um, becomes exposed. Um, obviously, you can send people um, to uh, if you if you have contracts that allow for it, um, and and probably um, under the common law as well, you can send people to be tested um, if you have concerns about whether they're um, fit or not, and you can exclude the person who is unwell from the workplace rather than sending anyone home. So there are lots of different options, all of which come down to, um, as Heidi said before, having the right information about what is the actual risk in the workplace and why are we what is the control measure we put in place? Why are we thinking that sending people home is, is necessary? Um, it sounds incredibly complex. Um, Heidi, the, the issues around sending people home uh, and paying them, you know, one of the things that a lot of businesses are worrying about is, is how do I continue to pay my employees? Do I have to continue to pay my employees if, if I send them home? Are you able to comment on that? It is worrying a lot of employers right now. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, for the employment law interested people out there, it's neck and neck. It was annualised salaries, but uh, COVID-19 calls, you know, neck and neck as to who's calling and asking about the most. COVID-19 has, has overtaken for obvious reasons. The uh, impact, of course, to are they able to work from home versus do we stand them down, as Shay was just articulating, is back to that risk assessment, what has actually happened. So many times I think now people are, are actually calling and asking, um, uh, can we make people take leave? Well, no one's actually sick yet and we're all just concerned about what can we do. It comes back to that plan. Have you looked at your industrial instruments? Have you looked at your contracts? It's probably not going to be feasible to do uh, home inspections for risk assessment from working from home. But fortunately, lawful and reasonable directions if you have the capacity to manage that about how people might be able to work from home and your expectations on them, will also help you to minimise your risks in the event that you have to do so. But when you start to, to look at the impact of, do you need to close down the business? Can you actually stand someone down? Do you have to pay them? You are going to need to look at the circumstances of what had occurred. An individual, as per our hypothetical before, Emma, of someone saying, I think I've got symptoms and the next day I've been diagnosed as having COVID-19, clearly that person is not going to come back to work. But for the period of their medical absence, they are on personal leave, sick leave. However, what is the impact for the rest of the workforce? Whether or not that person had uh, exposure to co-workers, as we said before, is then going to determine whether or not you have a need to send whole or part of your workplace home at least in circumstances where you can complete your risk assessment, manage your exercise of potential exposure, manage the impact of cleaning the work premises such as it can to ensure that before you let people back into the workplace that you can satisfy your health and safety and commitments regarding those proper considerations of the risk in terms of what was the factor that caused you to have this concern in the first place. In the absence of a public health directive, 
we really do need to consider what are the circumstances that arise. If somebody has concern that their brother's uncle's aunt's sister, and I kid you not, I do get quite a few of these questions, may have been exposed, understanding that disclosure up front and finding out whether or not this is a real risk and encouraging people to seek advice of a medical practitioner and get clearance if there are sensible and appropriate reasons to do so is going to be a first threshold. If somebody actually has gone to a doctor and has COVID-19 and has been tested, which is what we are approaching at the moment, clearly that then means they're on sick leave. If somebody says, I think I am affected because I have traveled to one of our high risk um, countries and I need to self isolate. What does that mean then in terms of what they're paid? Now, obviously dependent upon the circumstances of our daily update in relation to travel restrictions, uh, moderate to high risk um, and you know, low risk of exposure, we need to again then assess, is that person capable of working from home? Do they have any symptoms? What are the circumstances around their employment? And potentially you may have a situation where they will be continuing to paid while work or again if they get medical clearance or they don't get medical clearance because they need to stay home for the 14 days, they can access personal leave. The ability to not pay someone will need you to be able to trigger the stand down requirements, meaning that for circumstances beyond your control, they cannot work. It is a combination of that and obligations of lawful directions in accordance with work safety. Now the more complex thing that then comes about as you go through is not the individual scenario but everybody. And what happens when you have casuals? Casuals don't have any leave entitlements. The circumstances are that Australia's workforce consists of about 25% casual employees. So when they are not exhibiting symptoms, ensuring that people are not going to feel penalised by failing to disclose that they have been exposed or may have symptoms is a real risk. Go back to my comments earlier about having a clear plan of communication with employees so they know what is happening. Both the government and also some employers have already started to communicate on initiatives in relation to supporting casuals, some with offering payment for a 14 day period in the event that they are exposed and or to ensure that they're not going to be penalised for coming forward and making those disclosures and the government is also um, providing initiatives for access to benefits through Centrelink faster. The issue of course is, is with employees you can agree to take other forms of leave but just remember this is the start. Personal leave might be needed later so think carefully before we start exhausting leave but also think carefully before you start giving ex gratia leave, leave in advance. For an isolated incident now uh, of uh, self-confinement, isolation, it's a reasonable and good thing to do. But can your, your, your business sustain a tidal wave of everybody needing to be paid in advance? Cash flow, back to business interruption insurance and looking at your policies, these are really important things to think about now before we knee jerk and move forward and make decisions that we might regret. And Hattie, are you able to comment on the announcement that was made today by the government around uh, access to Centrelink? Uh, so that was the comment I was making before yeah. for casuals, yeah. that they're waiving the period yes. for being able to access um, additional benefits um, for personal leave. And that was announced today. Mm. Uh, Eleanor, you've talked about some of the um, privacy requirements uh, which seem um, at times challenging to navigate. In circumstances uh, such as the extraordinary ones in which we find ourselves, are there any exclusions or exemptions which can be helpful for businesses? Yep, and um, having just said, you know, we're dealing in a high risk situation in terms of sensitive personal information, it's also good to be able to say that there are a number of, say, exclusions or exemptions which are likely to be, I mean, obviously it's a case-by-case -case assessment, but m more, than, more than likely to be uh, responsive to this type of situation. Um, the first thing I'd say, though, before we sort of get into those very briefly is that I would say that um, where you can, uh, instead of having to rely on an exemption or an exclusion, see if you can at first instance de-identify the information. Now, that's not always going to be possible because for instance if you've got four people in a workplace 
and one of them is no longer in the office, you know, it's pretty clear what's happened. Um, but more broadly, if you can de-identify the information and deal with it in that manner, I think in the longer term, in terms of even something like work workplace cohesiveness, it's a much better strategy to do it that way. Um, of course, if you can't do that, um, and you are in that situation where you are disclosing, say, the, the fact that someone has a diagnosis of having uh, COVID-19, uh, um, the first exemption or exclusion that I'd look at uh, is the employee records exemption. Now that sits with um, corporations, so the private sector um, have the benefit of that exemption. And how that exemption would work is that uh, it disapplies the privacy, the Commonwealth Privacy Act in relation to effectively acts or, or things done um, in the course of an employment relationship. So <clears throat> it's the person who that relates to has got to be an employee and it's got to be about an employment record and health related information will fall within that ambit. So if you were, for instance, in an employment setting having to disclose the fact that an employee um, had that diagnosis, then that employee records exemption would be responsive to that. Um, there's also across the Commonwealth privacy um, regime and then in the states and territories, broadly uh, an exception that enables you to disclose personal information if that's necessary to respond to sort of a threat um, or a harm to an individual or to public health. So that would also be something, um, and again, you'd have to assess it on a case by case basis, but that's certainly something that sits there um, and would be responsive to a number of scenarios um, that we'd be dealing with here. Um, there's also the capacity under some legislation, particularly, say, for instance, the Commonwealth Privacy Act for the Federal Attorney General to declare a disaster or an emergency situation, which was done recently for the bushfires, um, which will enable certain things to happen, say, for identifying um, victims or providing health care to victims in that sort of bushfire uh, scenario that we encountered in the, in the Australian summer. So that's also available, potentially, but it depends on the Attorney General making that declaration. And how likely do you think uh, it is that that emergency declaration might be made? Well, I think... Um, You're looking more likely. Looking <laughs> well, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, well, as things are progressing, uh, it will just depend, obviously, if it fits within that, what, what we're dealing with here fits within that scenario, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's likely. But I think the other thing is, like, say, for instance, the bushfire issue, very much an immediate thing to respond to some of it. So whether or not there's any differentiation, but there's certainly that capacity to do that under that framework. Um, Chris, if, if my business is impacted and I can't comply with my obligations, am I unilaterally able to either suspend or terminate my contract with uh, <laughs> a lot of supply chain contracts and things like that? Well, it's a complex question. It will depend on careful review of, of what the contracts say and um, potential courses of action need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, um, having regard to the potential operational, financial and reputational exposures. Um, and there's also a high risk if uh, you purport to invoke, say, a force majeure provision under a contract or um, a, 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 you suggest that the contract's somehow been frustrated. Um, if that's done and it's not valid, then there's a risk that you're repudiating repudiating the contract, rather. Um, so that's something that needs to be carefully considered um, and legal advice obtained. Um, probably the most likely clause to apply if the contract has such a clause is a force majeure provision. Um, there's reports that a number of parties are already seeking to invoke these in, in the context of the um, COVID-19. Um, and, Chris, and just before we go on, yes. um, just in case there's anyone in our audience who doesn't know what force majeure is, can you comment on that? Sure. Um, in very broad terms, um, natural disasters and acts of God. Um, but again, it's something that's typically... I was going to say, you're on a religious theme. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, precisely. Things, things, so, beyond your, things beyond someone's control. Yeah. Um, Contracts vary broadly, there's two categories. Some contracts are specific as to the types of risks that are covered. Um, some contracts will say, for example, things that are beyond the reasonable control of a party that they can't mitigate and um, 
that prevents them from performing their obligations and some have a hybrid approach where they're both limbs. So um, that will depend on a careful review of the contract. Um, the contract will also dictate what the rights are in those circumstances. Um, but some contracts will allow, if, there's, if there is an event of force majeure, some contracts will allow you to uh, suspend your obligations? Yes, typically um, suspension or some other relief in extreme circumstances where um, there will be a protracted inability to perform the contract, there may also be termination rights. Does that um, include my gym membership? <laughs> <laughs> Check the terms yeah. of the contract. You can suspend that too. Unlikely, likely. Probably the two weeks at um, least. But apropos your yeah. point about the suppliers as well, it's interesting to note that the Chinese government has been issuing force majeure certificates to Chinese suppliers. Um, that is not something that's going to help somebody down the chain unless they've also. So if they're a downstream supplier and they've got su uh, on supply obligations to another party if, and they're in Australia, that's not going to assist them. Um, so that will turn upon the provisions in their own supply contract. And if uh, someone reviews their contract and there's no uh, suspension uh, or get out of jail free card due to force majeure, um, what are their options? Um, check termination rights. Um, there may be a right to terminate on notice, um, on potentially on other bases, um, particularly in the project context, though there'll be very detailed provisions um, around those types of rights. Um, again, more applicable to the construction contract, uh, context, but um, potentially uh, rights to very price or time frames um, where there's an inability per to perform. Um, and if all else fails, um, it may or may not be possible to assert that the contract's been frustrated. That's a very high bar um, to overcome, and it, in general terms, it requires demonstrating the parties never agreed to be bound in the fundamentally different situation which now applies. Um, so that that is something that's that's very difficult to prove, and again, um, you'd need to have very um, close consideration and, and legal advice saying that yes, I'm good to go on that. Um, I mean, an example of that, which comes back to the insurance context, would be, for example, a war. But obviously this isn't that extreme, but it's a, there's a spectrum and um, it would depend upon how severe um, things became. Eleanor, what steps can organisations be taking now to appropriately manage privacy risks? Mm -hmm. um, range of them but I think probably the key ones I would say the first thing is you should almost uh, do an audit if, if I can put it that way and it, uh, or say know your workforce in terms of are they employees are they contractors because the employee record exemption for instance will it implies to it only applies to employees so know what you're dealing with firstly um, secondly uh, I would I would say I mean all your communication strategies um, all the scripts that you develop for communicating these sorts of issues should all, should all be tested firstly against, well, um, can, I, can I do what I need to do by de-identifying a person as opposed to identifying someone? You know, what are the risks? Can I try and deal with this situation without, at first instance, creating a privacy issue? Um, and that's sort of what we would call adopt adopting almost like a privacy by design approach, which is best practice. Um, but you should then always be testing, of course, say, the scripts that you may have developed, your communication strategy against those exemptions and testing it to make sure that if you are going to make a statement of that nature, you're on fairly solid ground that you'll be able to and, you know, those exemptions or exceptions will be responsive to that statement. So they're probably the first. I mean, there's a range of privacy things, but if I had to say two, that's probably the top two. And that's particularly the case because you're not necessarily just a lot of these communications are going yes. broadly out yes. to the, to yes. the ether and yeah. perhaps the courier mail and <laughs> yeah yeah and, and I mean when you think about it even if you you're not sort of necessarily focusing on the regulatory consequences of not getting it not doing it properly um, you know the reputational um, issues that can come about if you know say for instance you um, through error identify someone as, as having that diagnosis um, and thinking about the damage that it can cause. So it's incredibly important to make sure that all of, you know, every bit of communication is tested rigorously against 
the sort of the regulatory process. And not to take on your questioning role, um, Emma, but um, it, that's not just the person who's been diagnosed, is it? If we've got vulnerable workers who may have specific health issues that we're trying to manage, we've got to look after their privacy concerns. Absolutely, as well. yeah, yeah. Sorry, Emma. <laughs> well done, Shay. Um, Chris, you've, you've spoken about um, the risk that some insurance policies simply aren't going to respond to the current circumstances. What steps should companies be taking? Sure. So, broadly, three steps. Number one, assess the likely heads of loss, the likely quantum of loss to the extent that they're able to do so. Uh, number two, review your policy suite and try and match up those policies with the anticipated loss um, and carefully review the, the scope of cover, firstly, but secondly, the potential for exclusions to apply. Um, and thirdly, notify. Um, notify of any actual or anticipated loss or if there's circumstances, which there likely are, um, that you anticipate may give rise to loss. And that's especially critical if policies are coming up for expiry. Um, in terms of uh, claims, so I won't go into detail about that, but um, there'll be a duty to mitigate loss um, and there'll also be uh, obligations to provide a certain level of information to insurers around loss that it falls within the scope of the policy if you're covered. Um, so keep good records. And to Hades' point about potential cash flow issues, um, do your best to try and negotiate interim payments with the insurers so that you're not waiting until everything's played out and you've you know, spent a couple of months quantifying all of your loss. If there are contentious and non-contentious items and the non-contentious items have been quantified, well, get some money in the door. And if, with interest rates so low, talk to your bank. Also figure out other things that might alleviate some of the pressures on businesses right now because uh, we're not in it alone. And, and on that note, one of the items that we covered in the paper that Clayton Newts issued uh, earlier this week uh, was the ability for potential tax deferral uh, mm. and payroll tax exemption. Mm. Uh, so I think there are a range of things. Exactly right. Um, Shay, this is, this is all incredibly stressful for a number of people for a number of reasons. Um, what should organisations be doing to deal with the mental health aspects? Yeah, I think we, we have to remember as, um, I guess, as individuals and as companies, um, you know, it, mental health is a, a work health and safety issue and, and we do have an obligation to ensure the health and safety of our workers and others. And I think we are getting caught up in the um, data sharing and the statistic sharing and the, um, we're calling it information sharing, but there's actually not a lot of information being given. There's just a lot of noise. And um, I think it is creating uh, quite considerable issues. Um, and again, we have to take into account our vulnerable people because there are people who have already uh, known mental health illnesses where the uncertainty and the continued, we, we, you know, you're going to work from home, you're not going to work from home, everyone's being evacuated, you're not being evacuated, um, someone has a diagnosis, oh no, they don't, um, actually creates um, triggering events for them. And we have to take into account managing those people. Um, part of that's about clear messaging and, and not um, over-escalating and, and, um, and uh, giving inconsistent messages. Part of it's expl about explaining why we're doing the things we are, as I talked about before, you know, some of these cancelling or um, closing of events makes people afraid that everyone is contagious and I'm going to be at risk, whereas if we actually explain that we're just doing our best by the community to help those vulnerable um, people, suddenly it seems like we're all doing something very community spirited rather than a hysterical um, response. Um, Taking into account our workers who are working at home is really important. People get quite isolated when they work from home and it may be for extended periods. We don't know how long this will take. It obviously um, has started to, to slow down in China, um, so that's sort of a three-month period. But, but one of the things we are seeing in the press about China, of course, is, is that people are feeling very isolated working yep. from home because it has been for an extended yep. period. And we don't know as well that the same thing will play out here because we obviously have different um, seasonal issues. We're going into winter, um, it, so it, it may be a longer, a longer period. Um, so keeping in contact with them, um, making sure they have the appropriate resources to do the job. All the studies say 
that people feel under stress when they're asked to do more than they're able to with the resources they have. Now, that includes making sure everyone has enough toilet paper at home. That's, <laughs> that's important. Um, I have also heard that tonic water is on, um, you know, <laughs> short supply. Um, that's what I need for my workplace. But it, it, in all seriousness, do, do they giving them the resources that they need to do the job, not asking them to do more than they can with what they have, and then if we can't get them those resources, actually making sure they understand that their role will be um, modified during that period. So, you know, people are worried about their pay, having clear messages about pay, um, having information about access. If we're not going to pay them access to Centrelink, what are the other alternatives? Um, giving them as much um, clear and consistent information can reduce a lot of those workplace pressures. And of course, having access to EAP and the usual um, supportive things that companies should do. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, that's been very enlightening, uh, certainly for me. Um, I think there's no question that the declaration of this disease as a pandemic does signal to everyone that, um, that, that this is serious and that we need to react appropriately. Uh, but I do think that the whole globe is in this together um, and fighting a common enemy. Uh, I think without a viable vaccine, uh, the best measures are aggressive hand washing, uh, disinfection of contaminated surfaces, uh, some social distancing and keeping your hands and fingers away from the mouth. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everyone attending today and we look forward to seeing you in the near future.